This is the Open University. Assalamu alaikum, my brothers. Um, it is accomplished. It may be accomplished. We may have finished the accordion album. We, I say we. Um, actually, one of the themes of the record is the uh, the tension between I and we. Here with my glass of chilled tap water to talk you through the last four songs. Um, I started this record on June the 30th, so it's it's just been three weeks, but it feels like an eternity, and I'm running out of uh, stamina. Um, physically, it's very racking. It's not so much that it's physically demanding as the opposite, really, that it's it's physically restricting, that you lie there in one position and, and, and don't get enough exercise. And so um, this is why I only do this with this kind of fanatical intensity for short periods of, of each year, three weeks or four weeks a year, I make an album. And um, somebody asked me um, on Facebook, how do you produce such high quality so quickly? And um, <laughs> so I answered very methodically with um, six points. Um, the first point was, I've been doing it for a long time, and you just do get good at things you keep doing for years. Second point is that I'm kind of fanatical about pop music, and it's probably not as important as I think it is. Um, Partly because I'm rooted in the 1960s. Um, that was actually my fourth point. Um, I'm, I was born in the 60s and to this day I notice that I'm basically drawing on that decade a lot in my songs. Um, third point, which I just skipped, um, the way I work is super intense. I may not have a laser-like focus when I do other things, but when I record, everything else just falls away and only the song matters for up to 15 hours, which includes making a visual uh, video for the song. Uh, the satisfaction of making a good song, including the narcissistic satisfaction of thinking well of oneself, is um, enormous. And the sixth reason, if I take a day off, like I did on Sunday, I feel as if everything else in life is kind of boring. So it's what I call the strong force. It's a bit dangerous dabbling with the strong force, that thing which, whether it's drugs or some fanatical hobby you pursue, makes everything else look a bit weak, or love, you know, especially love makes everything else look kind of inadequate and weak and pointless. So I've always sort of steered clear of love and drugs and if I could help it, because I'm a bit scared of intensity per se. Um, but I do love the intensity of my engagement with music. So let's talk through the four songs. Facial Recognition was the first one I came up with and this is a bit of an umpa kind of circus song um, at first glance. Uh, but it deals with a fairly serious subject, which is the technology which is linking facial recognition, which um, I was familiarizing myself with because I bought this new iPad and it, the first thing it asked, I spent a whole day just sort of wrestling with the security features of this damn thing before it would work properly for me. It took me through so much bureaucratic hassle, basically, and, and that included doing facial recognition scans. and. Um, of course, in the, the last computer that I bought, it was just fingerprints and things, but now it actually has to know your face. And of course, then you can start paying for things with your face. Isn't that interesting, paying with your face? It's a bit like karma. You know that we are now face in the sense of public standing and um, facade has now become the new currency or is about to become a new currency because of the connection which is being pioneered in China, especially between facial recognition and social credit schemes like so-called Sesame Credit where if you, have, if you are of good standing, not just financially, but in all areas of your life, including morally, according to the government's criteria anyway, you will get access to travel, dating schemes, bank loans, and all the rest of it at a much better rate or a much higher level than if you're of low standing, a criminal, a thief, or an Uyghur Muslim, perhaps. You might be from the Western provinces and be an, an untrusted, Chinese citizen because you come from the wrong racial group and cultural group. So um, this is a very worrying development and people like Charlie Brooker have taken us through some of the possible consequences in his Black Mirror TV series. Um, 
it should give pause to anybody who's even slightly libertarian because um, we have a freedom to be, to make mistakes, to be bad occasionally, to, to be Janus faced, you know, to, to have several faces or several identities. This is something that gets explored a bit later in the song about thieves. Um, so the facial recognition song started with, uh, I suppose, Rambling Sid Rumpo. Uh, Kenneth Williams had this character who was a folk singer who, um, whose songs were actually written by Marty Feldman, the fantastic Marty Feldman and Barry Took. And he basically, he basically comes from a, 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 this oddly split world where he's a kind of rustic, uh, an innocent rustic character who's singing the kind of songs that um, Alan Lomax collected for his American Patchwork and other, other endeavours he had. Um, but people are kind of bored by that and, and they start giggling. You sort of imagine a room where there's some old man is singing an old folk song that nobody really cares about. Um, and then people hear some double entendres and the fiddle de rolls or whatever and they um, start giggling because the, they start hearing sexual innuendo in it. And this is very much, if you listen to the Rambling Sid Rumpo record that's on YouTube, um, apparently the audience was super drunk before the recording session and Kenneth Williams complained in his diary that they weren't really listening because they were too drunk. They were laughing too loud, he had to keep stopping. And um, But but it, what the world he sets up in Rambling Sid Rumpo songs is um, there's always somebody, essentially himself, a bit in a, a sort of gay underground, you know, Polari kind of world where he's cottaging in toilets or, you know, he's doing, uh, doing sort of rude things in public places, essentially. And um, it's all it's all handled in the double entendres. When I was one and twenty boys, me bolder did I plight, and many's the lamak I did stroke beneath the pale moonlight. Sing all the way me passed Meg, there's limpets on me down. I am old and silly boys, me bogle silver ore. I cannot throw me lumpets now, and me heart it is for sore. So, on the one hand, they are kind of quite like folk songs, and they use you know, waltzing Matilda or whatever is the music. But on the other hand, they set up this kind of 1960s world where to be a homosexual was still to be a criminal in the eyes of the law. And so you had your own language, Polari, you had your own rituals, your own kind of secret handshakes and gestures, and you had a, a, a world of um, criminal public sex. So um, the song really says, well, what if that guy's rambling Sid Rumpo stroke Kenneth Williams himself, although it's more like a Joe Orton thing, because Kenneth Williams, who was a friend of Joe Orton's, was not as bold as Orton was. Um, what if we put that character into the 21st century, um, where there is this, there are these cameras, security cameras everywhere, there's a paranoid state apparatus in, in most countries. And um, one of the criticisms of, of the song when it appeared was that I was, it was like a 1950s propaganda film by the Americans against the Chinese or something. All I'm saying is that the Chinese are more advanced in this technology or the linking of these technologies than the rest of us. Doesn't mean that the rest of us are not gonna do it and are already starting to do it. So there are a lot of um, government uh, committees and things in Britain just now warning against the use of facial recognition technology or saying we should suspend trials of this stuff, but they're not going to be listened to. It is going to go ahead and we're gonna because the temptation of power is always there. It's always to, towards total domination of the subject, of the, the citizen. It seems inevitable that because we have the means to do this, we are going to have to go through a century, just as we have done with cars, which have been a terrible mistake in my view. We're going to go through a, at least a century of you know, knowing as much as we possibly can uh, on databases about people and what they get up to. So um, facial recognition, it's really... Um, a development of karma, and um, I, I suppose you know I, my innovation was to give 
rambling Sid, a Scottish accent, and, and to use kind of made-up Scottish words for the things he's getting up to, um, which are mostly just... He seems to be just scratching his balls on the street, but he's, he's very nervous that um, he can't do this anymore, and he says he's going to go to Spain next year. But, of course, it's just... It's a, it's a, a slippery slope. I mean, all countries are going to be like China in the future. So that, that was a jokey little song with a serious subtext. And um, I do like this kind of idea of innuendo as a parallel world because it is quite subversive. If you listen, you know, the Marty Feldman and Kenneth Williams and this kind of queer core um, uh, subversion, which was possible before the gay world turns to marriage and the emulation of normality. So that's that song. Um, the next one was very different and was a very personal song called Inside. Um, and this really... This, we have to talk about the, the sort of psychedelic influences on this album. It's funny because I was going to do this um, memoir called Drugs and then in the end it became called Niche and um, it wasn't about drugs anymore. But I am fascinated by drugs despite never really having engaged with them. Just as I'm fascinated by crime, theft and robbery and all the rest of it without ever having really stolen anything. I'm pretty honest um, in, in that respect. But um, it's... Uh, this song started with um, Kevin Ayers, who was a member of Soft Machine in the late 60s. Soft Machine was Robert Wyatt's band and, you know, a Canterbury-based um, uh, psychedelic rock band. And it's kind of nice for me to know that, um, that I've kind of contributed in a small way to Kevin Ayers, or he died actually a few years ago, but I did contribute to his finances as I did Robert Wyatt's by um, using a, a sample from Soft Machine's first album, it was a, a, a track called um, called uh, So Boot If At All, uh, which I sampled for Kahimi Kari's hit, and it was a, a pretty big hit in Japan, Good Morning World. So it's got this guitar line going, kind of backwards sounding guitar, which comes in on the choruses of my song. So th that was actually cleared when Matador released the record in America, and um, so... Wyatt and um, Ayers got some money. Ayers left Soft Machine after a year, after touring America with Jimi Hendrix. He sort of burned out with the rock lifestyle and went to live on beaches in Spain with um, um, David Allen and other members of Gong and that sort of hippie collective. So his first album, which was recorded in London at Abbey Road, it's called Joy of a Toy. And uh, he's, he's using like the drummer from um, Gong, uh, that, that kind of group of people that he was hanging with and um, he made a song on that album called Song for Insane Times and I, I listened to it somebody just put it on Facebook and I listened to it and I thought god that sounds like one of my songs his voice he's got this more nonchalant kind of Nick Drake voice and um, and it's very middle class as well it's Al Stewartish a bit you know folksy but actually not so folksy because the music is more jazz it's very sophisticated chord sequences and things so um I listened to that and thought, wow, that could be one of my songs. So I started sort of covering it. and um, But it was an unreliable cover because I, I thought, um, I won't listen to the original again. I just heard it once, really, or twice, you know. And then I just went off and started making a chord sequence, which was kind of inspired by it and by the way the melody worked with it. But actually, it just got, as I forgot the original, it got further and further away. So I was kind of terrified when I'd finished this song inside that it was still going to sound like um, Song for Insane Times. But actually it sounds totally different. I don't think it sounds like the same thing at all. Um, it's really, it's branched off sufficiently to be a, an original song. And it's a love song um, to my girlfriend who lives on the Place d'Alicua in Paris. And it's really just a very realistic description of the homeless people who look like the Egyptian woman or the woman listening to Muslim pop outside our uh, the main building door. Um, apparently the day I published the video, made the song public, um, she was robbed. So I've um, advanced some funds to try and tide her over. But um, because I feel like she's a character in my song, I feel like I'm exploiting her financially in some way. Um, but uh, she... Um, She's part of this scene of familiar people, including some annoying people who live on the square. Uh, like there's a guy with a very noisy dog who just sits on the bench all day and shouts very loudly at his dog in a very authoritarian way, possibly because he's so downtrodden himself. He wants to, you know, if, you, if you're treated like a dog yourself, you kick your dog, your actual dog, and then your dog kicks 
the cat or whatever. It's a cycle of abuse. But um, going to Guérisol and buying a blouse and trying it on, and then, of course, going home and lowering the blinds and having sex, it's all very much how I live, <laughs> how I live in Paris, and it's rather glorious. Um, and although the song is about being inside, it's mostly about descriptions of what you're hearing inside of the outside. So in a way, it's, it's the same theme that keeps recurring on this record of, is there salvation individually? And that includes in private property. You can have your utopia in your beautifully designed apartment, but if everybody else is not on the same page as you, it's somehow you're somehow still restricted. You, you can't really achieve freedom or enlightenment without bringing everyone else with you. Uh, and that's, you know, that's also a political message that everyone or, no, or none, you can't just have a few people who get through to the beautiful or the good life. You really have to bring everybody with you. And that's a definition of, of, of you know, utopia. Um, the Place de Ligre, um, actually in the video, it's, um, it's the window of the room that I was living in last year in Tokyo in Soshigaya. So it's a very tranquil Japanese window, which just has the, the opaque paper uh, shades and has the shadows of trees being stirred by the wind projected onto it. And um, that's a nice uh, abstraction of the world, a very Japanese and, and sort of, I suppose it's a nice visual image of um, either a an ascetic withdrawal from the world or a sexual withdrawal. Because one of the other themes of the record is climbing Mount Venerous. This is the line that comes from the, what the Kite Saw song. Mount Venerous, of course, being the Mons Venerous, which is the female sexual organ. So uh, that's one way to transcend is, is through a private sexual encounter where you're with someone beautiful. You feel like all is right with the world because you're, you're, <laughs> you're enjoying yourself physically in a private place. But um, again, the, there is always this intrusion from outside and there's weather passing across the song, there's thunderstorms, there may be weather going wrong, there may be climate change, there may be heat waves, thunderstorms, extreme weather conditions. So all that is, is impinging, you know, uh, it's, it's a partly the pleasure of being in a dry place when it's wet outside and also in a wet place because there's the double meaning also in the song of the... Um, what Leonard Cohen called the cave at the tip of the lily, which is this, the female sexual organ being the ultimate inside. So you're not just inside an apartment, but you're inside the, <laughs> the hollowed out Mount Venerous. Um, so that's, um, someone said it sounded a bit like Sade, not the Marquis de Sade, but the 80s <laughs> singer, um, Saad. Um, and I, I, actually, when I was writing the song, I was so moved by it that I was weeping. I suppose I was really lonely and really missing my girlfriend. And um, so I was actually crying a lot, I, in a, with happiness, tears of happiness. I mean, really uh, moved deeply, especially with this Be My Lover and Be My Wife line at the end. And, for, you know, spend, <laughs> spend the rest of my perfect life with me. I'm going to break up again if I, if I recite this. Um, but, yeah, I'm getting soft <laughs> in my old age. Um, the next song was a little bit of a, again, a dialectical switch, and it's called The Thief, and it's um, really uh, Jean Genet's, you know, I just see books, um, I've got Jean Genet's, uh, Sartre's book about Jean Genet, which is called A Thief and Martyr, um, Saint Genet, where he, he sort of inverts all the traditional Christian values of, um, and says, you know, that as, as Genet does in his own writing, he's, he basically says that... Um, um, genius is um, well. Sartre says genius is not a gift, but the way that the way out that one invents in desperate cases. But Genet kind of plays with this Wildean inversion of normal values. So betrayal is the ultimate form of devotion. Petty delinquency is uh, brazen heroism, and confinement is freedom. Um, the kind of paradoxes that you get either in Orwell's Brave New World when the state is applying them or when an individual is applying them they might be a bit like Oscar Wilde's kind of um, inverted and you know in, invert has a double meaning because an invert is a gay person so it's a queer logic of, of inverting the values of the normal world which he does especially in his plays um, so I, I say that stealing is vocational. I, I say in the song that uh, a lot of the lines in the song come straight from the thief's journal. Um, and I say that um, I, I particularly like um, the idea that 
If you're a thief, you have to be sharp-witted and intelligent because one single slip can uh, lead to your arrest and imprisonment. And uh, of course, it's a bit like a Cold War thriller or something that you're, um, you have many identities. You have to remember who you are, keep in character. There's a, a character in the song who's uh, in a cheap Belgian hotel and fails to shave his beard off and gets caught by the police, the dunderheaded opium smuggler. These are, a lot of these are lines from, um, from the Thief's Journal. And um, I particularly like Genet's idea that uh, anyone who doesn't depend for their life, essentially, on their intelligence, can't really claim to be a thinker. And this must have appealed to Jean-Paul Sartre. The idea that, you know, there is a world in which intellect is absolutely a condition of your survival. Not just, you know, that I'm going to write a new book, I'm going to take some speed and write 600 pages about this weird thief guy. It's also just that the thief guy himself, to, to survive at all, had to be smart. Street smarts, as we call them. So, um, I have this aphorism, larceny and luxury go hand in hand. And I, I kind of imagined that this would be what Genet would do if he gave a TED talk. Musically, um, it comes again from Kevin Ayers, because Kevin Ayers was brought up in Malaysia, as it now is Malaya, as it then was. And um, he, um, one of the tracks on his first solo album is um, called, it's a it's sort of experimental track, a psychedelic um, drumbeat based on a Malay folk song called Ole Ole Bandu Bandong and the drumming really has this uh, heavily compressed sort of delayed Ringo Starr kind of feel to it. Um, I think it's probably Rob Tate of Gong. Um, it's got this rock and roll sort of delay on it and it, the strings added to that drum beat it begins to sound like I am the walrus or something like that, late Beatles, psychedelic Beatles, Lennon-esque. So when I was singing it I was singing kind of channeling John Lennon a bit um, but people thought it was Bowie-esque. That was kind of interesting. Um, and um, this is the only—it's the only song on which the accordion doesn't feature because there was some I recorded some, but I took it out. So um, it turned out well because it had a mysterious. I like particularly the um, the structural irregularity, which I I was going to take out, and I thought, no, 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 keep that in. The lines in the middle of the verse where it um, do 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 it kind of isn't a, a regular. Um, time signature or bar metrical schema you know and that's very psychedelic too I guess it's very Pink Floyd or something um, keep in the mistakes keep in the irregularities and it, it's much more interesting um, Loneliness is another dream song uh, this is the last song I think it might be the last song on the whole album but I tend to as in as in last year's um, uh, Pantaloon record I came along at the last minute with this I, I think it was it's my favourite song on the record um, Goodbye Mr Quinn um, very melancholy kind of ballad um, with a Cold War feeling to it. Um, so maybe there'll be a late arrival between now and the end of the month. I don't know. I might just stop, though. We're going to have a heat wave. Maybe I'll go out and enjoy the sun for a while. Um, but uh, and, and get my body back, you know, get my being in the world, <laughs> to be all Heideggerian on your asses, um, back in order. But yeah, loneliness... Um, I dreamed of this, I woke up in the morning, um, I sleep on these bedrolls, you know, and I kind of wake up and I immediately just have some memories from the dream, and I, often they include musical memories, those songs. So I dreamt this Joni Mitchell song, I thought it was a Joni Mitchell song about casinos or something, and um, I started making a chord sequence on the iPad with a guitar sample, guitar sounds. And then I chopped it around and it really, really was changed and changed enormously. And, and as I was working on the chords, this whole other... I had some, some set of lyrics initially which were discarded. A whole other song formed around the word loneliness. Loneliness, I thought, wow, it's lonely at the top. In a way, it's... Um, I mean, I am feeling lonely because I've been in is working in isolation for three weeks, essentially, with just occasional social encounters here and there. Um, but, but really intense and focused and... Um, so it's based partly on this personal feeling of loneliness, but also the, the, the ultimate loneliness of um, self-improvement. This almost reminds me a little bit of the Dr. Evil speech in um, um, the Austin Powers film, because uh, there's something about uh, Zoroastrianism and testicle shaving and um, uh, relentless self-improvement 
in that speech which uh, touches a chord with me. It's a Nietzschean speech. This, this uh, Dr. Evil is, is with, a thera- with his son in a therapy group, fathers and sons therapy group, where um, he basically strikes fear uh, into everybody's heart by his utter difference from them. The difference of his youth, which includes luge lessons in Rangoon and all the rest of it, um, which actually is weirdly similar to, or having his testicles shaved by a Zoroastrian called Vilma, it's weirdly resonant for me because I have been to Rangoon, you know, and I, I had a, a pair called Vilmine when I was, you know, a child. And um, the idea of relentless self-improvement has, has not been absent from my life. So um, I can really identify with what Dr. Evil, not with evil per se, but with what Dr. Evil is saying and, and the way that he's alienating those normal suburban dads with their kids in that scene. Um, I've always found it quite lyrical. Um, that he is he's evil and yet if you look into his past you see that and this is a, actually a Sartrean theme as well that there is a, a an initial trauma from which uh, people are recovering damaged people are trying to recover from some some awful thing that happened in their childhood uh, and this is also what happened with Janae so um the loneliness, the Nietzschean loneliness of the high achiever, the person, the, the wanderer on the mountains. And of course, the song refers and the video refers to this Caspar uh, David Friedrich painting, The Wanderer Above a Sea of Fog, which is the ultimate romantic, Im- romantic image of individualism, that somebody has um, come to the top of a mountain and is surveying the world below in a kind of state of solitary grandeur and isolation. And it's the ultimate image of um, what an individual might be able to achieve, which would be to become, in Boris Johnson's words, world king. Or to feel for a moment that you're a world king as you're on the pinnacle. Um, And the irony is, you know, the romantic individualism and the Western individualism has this fatal flaw in it, which is that um, one person can't see as clearly as he thinks or she thinks he or she can. Um, And also that individual humans are cul-de-sacs. We all die. It would be a tragedy if somebody achieved total enlightenment and then just passed away because uh, then that enlightenment would go too. We need a collective enlightenment like the one we had in the 18th century. And again, collectivism is salvation, not individualism. So this character who's singing this song of loneliness, he's kind of me, or he's kind of the character we've seen right from the beginning of the the album who's climbing Mount Veneris, you know, he's maybe he's trying to find uh, enlightenment through sex, but uh, maybe he's just trying to get to a high place, you know, in, in any sense. And um, he's kind of, he gets there, he hits the heights by the end of the record, and all that results is just this pathetic feeling of loneliness and of isolation, being cut off from the world, from other people, from decisions. He can't influence the decision to go to war with Iran. He opens up in the third verse, he opens up Al Jazeera on his iPad. He sees that we're at war with Iran. He is, um, of course, he's in, he is Nietzsche in Das Spake that Zarathustra as well. And Zarathustra in that book is based on Zoroaster, who was an Iranian um, prophet, uh, philosopher, founder of religion, Zoroastrianism, which of course leads to Dr. Evil being, you know, having his testicles shaved, but also leads to, you know, um, a lot of um, Greek philosophy and even Christianity was influenced by, because this is centuries before Christianity, it was influenced by Zoroastrianism, by Zoroaster. So it just seemed appropriate that the song would come round to the attack on Iran as the outside event that this individual, supreme in his uh, hauteur, my, his auteur um, cannot control so um, it's about the the impotence of will the impotence of will um, of the individual Um, you cannot achieve your salvation you know I mean it's a self critique essentially because uh, his reaction to this war being declared is that he's in his happy place above the fucking herd (laughs) Which is not a very charitable or nice reaction, is it? I mean, yeah, great, you're in your happy place and we're having to get down and dirty and fight with, uh, with people in jets. So the jets in the video invade the, um, the splendid isolation of this character. And um, it's a terribly sad song, you know. It, did, it, has a, it has a bit of Joni Mitchell in it that we paved paradise and put up a parking lot. You know, that, that Joni Mitchell hippie 
sensibility is in there. She did get through to the final draft, but just in a, a more subtle way. Of course, there are musical references like the Pino Palladino um, bass harmonics and things like that, which were all sampled. Um, and uh, and the, way I'm, the way I'm arranging it with the flange on the guitar, it's a bit like Hijira, um, period, Joni Mitchell, very much uh, like Coyote or a song to Sharon. You know, I love Joni Mitchell. Peace be upon her, long may she uh, endure. Where do I go now? Because I think the record is finished. I think I really don't have the, I don't have the entrails, you know, I don't have the, the shaved Zoroastrian testicles to continue. People keep saying, make this a triple album, Nick, you're really on form. Um, I think it's done. I, I really do think it's done. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to probably go through the usual postpartum depression. Then I'll be making um, artwork for the sleeve and uh, scheduling the release of the record later in the year. It might be September, October, November, I don't know. And then um, I'll be working on the editing of my book Niche, which comes out next year in May. I've got a couple of concerts. I'm not doing many concerts this year. I'm being a bit more reclusive, partly because I don't need to financially. I'm, I'm okay just now. Um, but I've got a concert in Barcelona, I've got one in Stuttgart. I think that's pretty much it, actually, coming up in the next weeks. So I should put those on my website, I haven't done that. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm then just going to Paris and spend as much time as possible with my girlfriend inside, or climbing Mount Venerus. Open University. <laughs>